so far in our journey of biology, we've been talking about organisms on the cellular level, whether it be um, you know mitosis and meiosis of cells or the DNA within the cell that creates the uh, phenotypes of organisms. It's basically been on the microscopic level. We're going to take a shift now and um, talk about organisms on the population level, so how they're going to relate to each other and change over time. So a big question scientists always want to know is how did we and all of the species that we have now get here? So the big guy who um, you know came up with this idea of natural selection and evolution was Charles Darwin. And uh, he wrote a book called Origin of Species. And basically there's two main comments. Um, he said... Present-day organisms arose from a series of ancestors through a process of descent with modification. So each generation has uh, certain changes that happen to it uh, to create the species that we have today. And there's a process of natural selection, which is the mechanism for this descent with modification. So the reason why we get these modifications is because of what's called natural selection, the environment selecting for certain spe for certain characteristics of the species and not for others. So we're going to take a look at the details of this. Now the result of all of this natural selection is what we call evolutionary adaptation. And so it's uh, you know basically how species came to evolve to have the characteristics and um, <clears throat> adaptations that they have now for their certain environments. Now, at the same time as uh, Charles Darwin was doing his work, another guy la named Lamarck um, was also studying fossils and imprints of, of organisms which lived long ago and came up um, with some ideas that were similar but not quite exactly the same as Charles Darwin. Lamarck suggested that the traits that animals have um, developed in individuals and then passed on to their offspring versus um, developed through the natural selection of populations of animals. Um, <clears throat> also at that time, uh, a French guy, Buffon, I don't know how to speak French, but maybe that's how you say it, st also studied some fossils and he was kind of the, the first guy to really put out there that the earth was very old. All right, so if we take a look back to Darwin, because he is, um, you know, the, the guy that most scientists are actually going to use his work um, because it makes the most sense when we compare it to, you know, modern day genetics and stuff. So if we take a look at Darwin, um, he went on this huge voyage and um, <clears throat> read lots of geology books and stuff like that. And one of the books that he read um, suggested that the earth was very old and it takes millions and millions of years to shape, you know, the um, the non-living parts of it, like the mountains and the valleys and and uh, you know the rivers and stuff like that. So he took these ideas and he started to think about the same kind of ideas, but within living systems rather than non-living systems. So when he took a look at the fossil record, uh, you know, which is mostly found in sedimentary rock as sand and silt pile on top of each other um, in lakes and riverbeds and uh, nearby areas like that, uh, you know, it, they're going to become buried and more buried and more buried, and we're going to have lots of pressure be put on them over time, and um, it's going to turn into harder rock, and some of these organisms can get trapped in there and um, either kind of <clears throat> survive, not the organisms survive, but the, the tissues and stuff like that left behind, um, might have a chance to survive like the bones, or they'll just um, make an imprint within the rocks. Anyway, so organisms can be deposited along with all this sand and silt, and so they can get trapped in there, and that's how, um, you know, when we start doing digging these days, we can run into organisms or fossils of organisms that lived long ago. When we look at, you know, the, kind of the layers of rock, we see that the oldest layers of rock are the deepest, and they um, are usually going to have, like, the earliest, uh, most simple kinds of organisms, like prokaryotes, bacteria, and archaea. Um, 
And as you go up and up to younger rocks, you'll get uh, fish-like fossils and amphibians and reptiles and mammals and birds as you um, keep going you know, further and further nearer the surface. So um, <clears throat> because of this pattern, scientists have um, kind of figured that perhaps there's this evolutionary line where um, we start out with one kind of species and it evolved to make all kinds of other species. Other aspects of uh, species that we can take a look at when um, figuring out the evolutionary history behind them is uh, biogeography, which is a study of bio or geographic distribution of um, species, like where they are um, distributed within you know the the world and sediment layer and stuff like that. And then we can also take a look at comparative anatomy. So you know, the, the, arm, <clears throat> the arm bones and leg bones and stuff of different kinds of animals. And we can see that, the, that some of them um, can have similar bones. And so um, because of that, people have thought that they, you know, kind of evolved from each other. So if we see here on the right, um, there's a human, cat, whale, and bat uh, forearm or forelimb, I should say. Um, and it looks, you know, the bones are, I guess, somewhat similar in uh, shape and location, and so they figured, okay, from, uh, you know, we've got whales and bats and cats and humans are, have all have a common ancestor back in the day. Yet another area that scientists study when they are studying evolution is uh, comparative embryology, uh, because they say that uh, embryos of different animals look similar as they develop, that they must be related. So, um, for example, gill pouches are present in the development of all vertebrates, um, you know, but as they, as the different species develop, um, gill, the gills stick around in fish and, um, and uh, into, and then they turn into other structures and, in uh, other vertebrates, um, like the bones of the skull and, and, uh, stuff like that. So on the right is a picture of a chick embryo versus a human embryo, and because they have similar shapes and features, um, scientists claim that they are have you know a common ancestor and are common ancestor and are related somehow. All right, one last um, area of science that we can look at for evolution is um, molecular biology. So the genes and proteins of different species. And um, we can see that, you know, some of them, if they share a lot of the same genes and proteins that the animals have, then they are very, you know, more closely related than um, those that are, you know, don't share as many genes or proteins. So in this picture on the right, we've got, um, you know, different, I guess, the lineage to humans, I guess. Um, so, you know, old world monkeys, then gibbons, orangutan, gorilla, humans, and chimpanzees. Um, and it shows the uh, percent difference in selected DNA sequences. So we are, you know, more closely related to, you know, gorillas and chimpanzees than we would be to the old world monkey um, by taking a look at the genes and proteins that our bodies make. So, again, scientists have... Uh, figured that because we share more of the genes and proteins with gorillas and chimpanzees um, and less with the old world monkeys and the gibbons uh, that you know the old world old world monkeys and gibbons came first and then um, you know orangutan and gorillas and us so let's take a look at natural selection because that's the basic driving force behind evolution we can take a look at the nitty-gritty of the fossil record and the DNA sequences and the comparative anatomy and, um, you know, kind of get the details of how things may have evolved. Um, but the basic process behind it is uh, this idea of natural selection. And it's based on two observations. Um, first, all species reproduce with excessive amount of offspring. That means they've got tons and tons of babies that they're going to make. Um, and these babies are going to have variations. Um, you know, they're not going to look all identically similar. And all of these babies 
along with everybody else's babies, are going to um, have to struggle for survival because, you know, the world cannot continually support or sustain uh, infinitesimal life. So the natural resources in that particular area are going to be limited. And so there's going to be this struggle for survival. Now we do have to keep in mind that much of the variability that we see in the offspring is heritable, meaning it's passed from parent to offspring. So it's not like, you know, we're going to get, um, you know, two white monkeys mating and then all of a sudden we get a purple rainbow monkey. Okay. Um, that just doesn't happen. Uh, so there is some limit on, you know, the variability of this, uh, of the, the characteristics in a population. Uh, so we get that passing along from parent to offspring. <clears throat> now the inference is that these two observations are going to lead to differential reproductive success, meaning that those offspring that have um, the characteristics that are more able to survive in the natural resources and take advantage of those natural resources and or you know are easier to hide from predators or whatever are going to have an easier time surviving and reproducing, and the ones that don't have those characteristics will then die out. Now, scientists have come, you know, kind of to this conclusion of natural selection because they've been able to observe it. Um, <clears throat> we can see one example is the evolution of pesticide-resistant insects, um, which, you know, because back in the day, you know, we used chemicals in order to kill the bugs and crops and stuff, and um, those, those bugs have now kind of, you know, adapted to that insecticide or the pesticides and have been able to adapt their bodies to withstand it. And so um, that adaptation is passed on to generations after generation after generation. And now we get, you know, uh, <clears throat> insecticide resistant bugs. Okay, same thing with antibiotic resistant bacteria that we always hear about. Um, the bacteria have been able to overcome the uh, different antibiotic factors and been able you know, to survive and pass those traits on to the, you know, their offspring. So uh, this is something that scientists have been able to observe over time, and so uh, that's why they think this is correct. All right, so we're going to kind of take what scientists have seen today and relate it back to what Darwin saw uh, back, you know, 150 years ago. So Darwin, um, you know, classic example of Darwin is he travels to the Galapagos Islands um, down off the coast of South America, and uh, he sees different, like, species of the same type of animal. So he sees um, birds that look similar uh, but they have you know varying sizes of beaks or different shades of colors and stuff. And so he came up with this you know kind of natural selection, uh, meaning that the, the color or the beak shape is s selected naturally by the environment. Um, you know, the longer beaks were made for or selected for for those birds that need to you know uh, dig in deep holes to find food versus um, you know, the shorter beaks of birds that, you know, ha are eating, I don't know, fish or crabs off the sand. So um, <clears throat> that's where he kind of came up with this idea that the environment is going to help them um, select for characteristics that will help them survive. Okay, so when we take a look and we mesh Darwin with um, observations of today and what we know about genes and genetics, uh, we can see that they kind of go hand in hand. So a population is a group of individuals of the same species living in the same area at the same time. So um, a population, you know, usually is, like I said, um, area specific. So it might be, you know, the human population in Marietta Temecula versus, you know, the whole world. Uh, now the population is the smallest biological unit which can evolve. So individual, we don't really say that individual species involve, or individuals of a species evolve. It is the population of the species that evolves. 
Now, natural selection is going to act on the individual, but we're only going to see the results as we see which way the population shifts, whether it's toward um, <clears throat> small beaks versus long beaks for the birds, for example. For those populations that produce sexually versus asexually, asexually meaning they just make a you know exact clone copy of themselves, um, asexual reproduction is not going to have very much individual variation with them. But uh, remember from genetics and meiosis and crossing over and all, you know, the independent assortment and all those st statistics of genetics, uh, we know that individual uh, variability is common when we produce sexually. So some of the traits are going to be heritable. Um, some of them are going to be, you know, kind of a result of the envi environment. So um, this is kind of the nature versus nurture talk of scientists. You know, how much of it is genetics versus how much of it is, you know, for example, what you eat um, or you know, how much time you spend in the sun and stuff like that. So um, your environment can also play a part in the way that you look and the way that your body works. Now these variations within the species are going to come either from mutations in the DNA um, like we had talked about before, the base substitutions or base deletions, frame shift uh, mutations and stuff. And um, they can also come from the sexual recombinations, um, whether it's, again, meiosis, crossing over, um, or just the, the fact that, you know, some of the chromosomes from dad and others from mom are end up with in one egg cell versus, you know, a different combination in another egg cell. Uh, now when we talk about mutations, the actual changing of uh, DNA, mutations can create new alleles, either good, bad, or have no effect on the individual. So some mutations um, are good and adaptive and uh, make the species able to survive better in the environment. Some are not so good and they don't um, survive better in the environment. And some just don't have any effect at all. It doesn't matter, you know, what kind of mu those mutations, it doesn't matter what happened because it doesn't have any effect. Now, um, <clears throat> when we talk about short generation span organisms, you know, think bugs and stuff like that, um, they're usually going to change more by mutation rather than sexual recombinations. Um, organisms that live longer, like animals and humans, um, will change mostly through sexual recombinations um, rather than mutations, although it still very much still does happen um, that somebody gets some kind of mutation in their DNA and then therefore has some kind of, some kind of disease um, that you know makes them survive less than um, what's expected. Oh, I got a little ahead of myself in the last slide. Um, because this slide is, is where we talk about longer generation span organisms are going to use, again, sexual recombination, um, usually to achieve genetic variation. All right, to the evolutionist, uh, these mutations and sexual recombinations are random processes. So um, it is totally random whether it's going to happen or not. However, natural selection and evolution are not random because um, the environment is the one that's basically controlling which ones of those um, genetic combinations or mutations are going to enhance survival and um, increase reproductive rate or which of the you know mutations and, and recombinations are going to be detrimental to survival and therefore die out over time in a population. So the environment basically is what is controlling everything in evolution and natural selection. Okay, so if we dig a little deeper into modern day genetics and link it back to Darwin, um, we can find, you know, some connections there. So if we take a look at the population genetics, um, population genetics is a gene pool that consists of all the alleles and individuals in a population. So if we take a group of snakes in a certain area, it's all of the alleles for the um, different phenotypes that those snakes possess. 
the gene pool is a reservoir from which the next generation gets its genes, obviously. I mean, you know, um, two, gene, two snakes mating isn't going to make a mouse. So um, the genes have to come from this, you know, parental population unit. So, um, and these parental populations have all the genes that could be, that, all the possible genes that could be passed down from generation to generation. And of course, for your learning enjoyment, um, somebody has put mathematics to genetics and uh, evolution. And uh, these two guys are Hardy Weinberg, um, Hardy and Weinberg. Um, so we can do a little mathematical analysis of gene pools by using what's called the Hardy Weinberg formula. So if we take, if we, for example, if we take a look at a population of flowers that only has two colors, so we take a look at this you know, population of flowers on a certain hill somewhere, and there's only two colors, red and white. And we see that 80% are um, you know, the dominant allele and 20% are of the recessive allele. The way the math works is that the frequency of the dominant alleles plus the frequency of the recessive alleles has to equal 1. It's like it has to equal 100%. So um, the frequencies of these genotypes in a gene population or gene pool is calculated from the frequencies of these alleles. So, you know, p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. If we take a look and see what, well, what the heck this p squared and pq and q squared, uh, well, p squared is uh, referring to the homozygous dominant trait. Uh, PQ is heterozygous, okay? And um, Q squared is the homozygous recessive trait. So if we kind of add all of those up together, they need to equal 1. And so we can um, kind of figure out the frequencies of these alleles in a particular population if we know, um, you know, kind of the frequencies that we start with, we can, you know, after some matings of over time, we can figure out the gene frequencies that these will have um, later. Now, there is a drawback to the Hardy-Weinberg um, equation. Hardy-Weinberg is going, that, that equation only applies if there's no genetic mutations and if there's no new individuals entering the gene pool, bringing new genes to it. So um, the Hardy-Weinberg uh, equilibrium has to, um, you know, kind of be in a location where there's a stagnant gene pool of non-evolving population. So it kind of requires this genetic isolation from other populations. So if you think about it, you know, some random town in the middle of nowhere, like the one on the right, um, you know, might actually be able to satisfy the Hardy-Weinberg um, equation. However, if somebody moves in to this, you know, some, somebody likes the little, you know, happens upon this little village here and wants to move in, then we've just, you know, kind of throw, thrown a, a curveball in the gene pool. We've added new genes to it, and so the Hardy-Weinberg um, uh, equilibrium or equation kind of will be thrown out the window. Because um, like we said, most populations are not isolated, and so they're going to gain or lose alleles um, by what we call gene flow. And gene flow is uh, the exchange, the genetic exchange with another population. Okay, so if we're, you know, talking about these guys on the right, this population of individuals um, and somebody, you know, some other family moves in, and mates with them, you know, we're going to have what's called gene flow or genetic exchange with other individuals that were not part of the original population. So this kind of goes just to, into a little bit more detail about what I was saying. So gene flow occurs when we get fertile individuals um, <clears throat> migrating between the populations. So if we're talking about those flowers that we saw again, um, you know, two populations of wildflowers can, can cross-pollinate each other um, due to a windstorm. So if you've got, you know, um, a population of red and white flowers on one side of the hill and purple and blue flowers on, you know, the opposite side of the valley, we can, if there's a huge windstorm, you know, it can carry pollen from um, one patch of 
flowers to another and you know those purple and blue flowers can then be you know cross pollinating or mating with the with the uh, red and white and so we can get a different population of flowers um, as a result in the next generation so this gene flow or you know genetic exchange of uh, different populations with each other is eventually going to reduce the genetic differences between the populations. Um, <clears throat> so if we think of the red and white flowers versus the purple and blue flowers on the other side, eventually because of you know cross pollination and windstorms and the pollen being spread you know on both sides of the hill, um, we're eventually going to see all the same kind of flowers on both sides of the hill over time. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, one of the, the caveats of uh, gene flow. Mutations can also, again, like we saw before, change the organism's DNA, but they are so very rare um, in those long, you know, long-term generation organisms um, that they're going to have uh, pretty little effect on the actual population. So, uh, but we can see, like, if there's, you know, a lot of mutations over the same time of mutations and a lot of them over time, we can get a cumul cumulative uh, kind of impact of those mutations on a population. Although, again, like I said, this is uh, much more rare than the you know, genetic exchange or genetic recombination of um, genes and alleles through genetic flow. Now, when we study um, you know, very early or very primitive organisms like bacteria and archaea. Uh, and those are, you know, kind of what evolutionists believe were the first kind of organisms that evolved into everything else. Um, it had to have been mutations as, you know, mutations had to have been the original source of genetic variation uh, because those kinds of organisms don't reproduce sexually. They are asexual organisms, so any genetic change had to have come from a mutation. So mutations are still important, even though they're rare in higher order species these days, they're still very rare, or still very important uh, to you know, the genetic variations that we see over time and how natural selection and, and evolution first started, get, started uh, going. Uh, now one more kind of... Uh, term that we have to talk about is genetic drift and this is a change in the gene pool of a small population kind of due to chance or due to you know some kind of mutation that actually takes a hold of you know the survival of um, you know a certain population somewhere so genetic drift is going to be kind of a change in the gene pool due to random chance of mutations so genetic drift and gene flow, reproducing with different populations and um, having mutations become evident in a population um, can cause what we call microevolution or small changes in a species, uh, but not really adaptation. Only the environment can basically select for um, if those you know, mutations or genetic recombinations will actually be adaptive and be able to help the animal or organism survive better. So it's all about the environment controlling everything in um, natural selection and evolution. Now again, um, there's one more caveat with that Hardy-Weinberg equation. Um, it basically another kind of um, pitfall to it is that it requires that all the individuals in a population survive and reproduce, um, which is never going to be the case. We're always going to have death of um, individuals and species before they're able to reproduce, uh, whether it's a bug getting smashed um, or, you know, somebody you know, getting in a car accident and, and uh, you know, not surviving until they reproduce or something like that. So if you look at the big picture of how natural selection is going to kind of uh, make new populations and uh, species, there's basically three general outcomes of natural selection. 
Okay, we can get what's called directional selection, in which um, the shift shifts the overall makeup of a population by favoring just um, the variant of one extreme. So that would be, you know, this right here. So if we started out um, with a population of very light colored mice through very dark colored mice, um, and the environment is going to select for the darker colored mice, that's what we call directional selection. Okay, the directional selection is basically just favoring the extreme, favoring the dark colored mice, and all the light colored mice are going to um, then, you know, not reproduce or not survive. We can either get that or we can get what's called diversifying selection, which is going, which is this one here, in which the environment will actually favor the opposite extremes, either really, really dark colored mice or really, really light colored mice, and everything in the middle isn't able to really survive. So that's what we call diversifying selection. And last but not least, we have stabilizing selection which is this one, which is where um, the environment actually selects for the medium colored mouse, not really dark, not really light, just kind of something in the middle. So that's what we call the stabilizing selection. So um, again, the environment is going to kind of drive everything, whatever um, is the best trait in order to survive in a certain environment, that's the one that's going to be passed down from generation to generation, and eventually we're going to see shifts in populations, whether they are shifting to one extreme or whether they are shifting to you know the middle kind of ground, or sometimes they'll even shift to both extremes and nothing in the middle. All right, so that's basically kind of the gist of natural selection and evolution and um, you know how we can get a change within a population over time.